I don't know if you've considered this, but you are my first class to graduate from this ministry that I have had since you entered it as seventh graders. So we've been a lot of places together, through a lot of growing up physically and spiritually. I've watched you fall in love and fall back out of it. I've been there with you through huge mistakes and through unexpected acts of goodness. I suppose a lot like a parent. I've been so frustrated with you at times that I could have found another job, I'd have taken it. And I've also been very proud of you. And I am proud of you. I'm proud of you not just because I've been with you, but because you've been with me. Unlike so many classes before you, you have been faithful. The acquiring of cars and significant others and jobs and added responsibilities, for the most part, has not driven you away from your faith or from this group of faith. And I've faithfully loved you and shepherded you, but I've made mistakes too. I've hurt some of you. I've done wrong to some of you. And on more than one occasion, I've had to humble myself and ask for your forgiveness. So you've been with me as much as I've been with you. And I'm proud of you. But I do have this against you. The first king of Israel... Saul already had made some really big mistakes in his life, offering unauthorized sacrifices to God. And yet in God's long-suffering and kindness, he is given an, a second chance or another chance to join God's mission on this earth. In this particular case, he is to carry out the justice of God against the Amalekites, and he's told to go down and destroy everything. And as the battle comes to an end and Saul's army emerges victorious, Samuel shows up, and he's tired because he's already been up all night long talking to God about this faithless king. And Saul, like an idiot, runs out all smiles. I've done the commandments of the Lord. And Samuel, exasperated, says, then why do I hear sheep? You were supposed to kill everything. Why do I hear sheep? And like us, Saul was raised in church. So he's good at finding spiritual jargon to sanitize his disobedience. And so he says, well, I, well, I saved the sheep so we could sacrifice them to God, of course. And they go back and forth for a little while. But at the end of it, Samuel says, you've done what is evil in the sight of God and you are rejected by God as the king of Israel. And now angry, Saul says, I have not disobeyed. I've done this and I've done that. And this one little exception, I fudged just a little bit so that I could sacrifice. And then Samuel asks that question. Is it better to sacrifice? Or to obey. And knowing that he has no more excuses, he confesses in 1 Samuel 15, 24, listen carefully, I have sinned. Indeed, I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and listened to them. I'm proud of you. But I have this against you, the fear of man. King Saul is a very sobering reminder to us that we will always obey who or what we fear. Saul listened to the voice of the people because he feared their opinions of him, because he feared their ability to accept or reject his leadership, and he wanted that position. 
And so he sinned against God because he listened in fear to the people. Fear of man is a deceitful, sneaky, lethal sin that so often goes unnoticed and unchecked in our lives. And what we fear is rooted very deeply in what we want, what we desire most. Because whatever you desire deep in your heart, what you want, that determines who or what you need to get what you want. And who or what you need to get what you want determines whose approval you need. And whose approval you need, you begin to fear. To work out, to please them. Whoever's approval you're seeking is your idol. We fear men more than we fear God when we're concerned about upsetting men or getting caught by people more than we're concerned about upsetting or offending our holy God. We fear men more than we fear people when we are so concerned with what other people think of us that we fail to confess him as our father to them. Whose approval are you seeking? Whether it's in your good deeds or your bad, whose approval are you seeking? Because if you're seeking anybody's pleasure or approval other than God, that is idolatry. Whose approval are you seeking when you choose what college you're going to go to or what major you will choose? Whose approval are you seeking when you determine how you're going to spend your time? How you're going to serve others? How you're going to pick out clothes or date or even lead a Bible study? Whose approval do you want? Because we always obey the ones that we fear. And like Peter said, standing before the Sanhedrin, with all the power and breathing threats of violence and persecution against him, we must Obey God rather than man. And my concern for you as a class, as a church, and especially as a younger generation, and I hope this doesn't sound like a harsh rebuke, but rather a concern birthed from love. I'm concerned about the weakness of this young generation. We come into this church and we talk big about what we believe and what our convictions are. And we go outside these doors and when we're interacting with our community, we don't have the courage of our own convictions. We compromise because we're terrified of not being socially acceptable. We compromise with the world around us We water down our message. We make it more palatable. And then we find ourselves very discouraged with the lack of vitality in our faith because we're sick to death of prostituting ourselves on the altar of social acceptability. I'm concerned that pragmatism has sucked the supernatural out of our churches, and I am very, very concerned that there is a severe shortage of bold spiritual leaders among young people. So I told you the story of Saul, but there's no lack of examples. Could have told you of Aaron and building the golden calf because he feared the people. Could have told you of Peter who denied Jesus three times to a little girl. The fear of man. It's a crafty beast who has crippled the strongest of men. So turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. And while you're turning there, let me give credit where credit is due. The outline or the four points of this sermon came... And, and other things that I will say in this sermon came from an old preacher that is quickly becoming a great hero of mine, Crawford Loritz. 
I knew I wanted to speak about the fear of men. And so in my research and hunt for ideas and texts, I came across this sermon by Crawford Loritz called The Call to Courage. And if it was not an hour and 10 minutes long, we'd be watching it right now. Such a great sermon. And I did my research and I read my commentaries and I did all the work that you do when you put into a sermon. But lest I be accused in several places of plagiarism, I'm not trying to hide the fact that Crawford Loritz's sermon has shaped the one I'm about to preach. So let's jump into Joshua chapter 1, 1 through 9. Now, it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, saying, stop there. That's our context. That's what's happening in the life of Israel. This Moses, this towering figure who casts his shadow over all of Scripture, their great deliverer, the great lawgiver, and their faithful pastor of 40 years is dead. In the final words of Deuteronomy, just a page before where we are right now, the Bible says that since the time of Moses, no prophet has risen like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face for all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to perform in Egypt against Pharaoh and all the servants and all of his land and for all the mighty powers and the great terrors which Moses performed in the sight of Israel. And now God comes to about 2, 2.5 million people who are filled with guilt and fear and doubt because Moses is dead and, and Joshua is the new leader. And just like Israel, you're on the banks, finishing one stage of the journey of your life, getting ready to go into another one. Whether you see them or not, the rapid rivers of life in front of you. Whether you realize it or not, terrifying enemies that want to destroy your soul out in front of you. And all those old leaders that you've grown to love and trust will not be with you anymore. So what do you need to do? What do you need to hear? Well, God says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and cross the Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to you, to the sons of Israel, Every place which your sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I have spoke to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, which is as far as the great sea towards the setting of the sun, will be your territory, and no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land, which I swore to their fathers to give to you. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do all according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it from the right or to the left, so that you may have good success wherever you go. And this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you will be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Four keys to biblical courage. Number one. Biblical courage, godly courage, rests on having a clear mission from God. Courage is not in a man. Courage is in a mission. And in these verses, God gives Joshua a very clear mission. This book begins with Moses is dead. Joshua, or Judges 1, begins with Joshua is dead. 2 Samuel 
uh, begins with Saul is dead. First Kings begins with David is dead. But when a man of God dies, nothing of God dies with him. Arise, Joshua, cross the river, take the land. And you, like every servant who has gone before you, are temporary and completely disposable. And that's good news. Because God doesn't need you at all. Is it not remarkable that he wants you? That he is inviting you to use your vapor of this life to be a small part of his eternal mission? Joshua, Moses is dead. Now get up and go after it. Proverbs 29 25 says, The fear of man is a snare, it means that it's a trap, and it keeps you from doing all that God has called you to do. And I know you, and I know several of you, you have vision, and you have dreams, and you have that urge of the Spirit in you, that you, you want to do great things for God, and to be quite honest, you're just wimping out. It's not a lack of commitment. It's not a lack of conviction. It's not a lack of whether God's going to be with you. It's not a lack of calling. It's a lack of you just getting busy doing what God has called you to do. And you know church lingo lingo well enough to sanitize your fear. Wow, I want to get ahead of God. I I need to do, do what my parents think is best. Waiting for a sign. But when push comes to shove, you're about 35 or 40 years away from a wasted life. So be bold. And do all that God calls you to do. Would you not rather die on mission than live in comfortable, regret-filled normalcy? Think about the people who have really changed the world. I mean, really changed the world. People like William Wilberforce, who spent his life being beat up by English Parliament, but pretty much single-handedly abolished the slave trade in Europe. People like William Tyndale, who literally gave his life so that we could have the Bible in English. People like Martin Luther and Mother Teresa, people whose lives mattered for the world around them. Do you think that they got up every morning and said to themselves, how am I going to play it safe today? They were bold. And every single morning, I drop my daughters off at school, and I say the same thing to them every morning. I say, intentionally act like Jesus. Find somebody to serve and be bold. Because the last thing I want to teach my kids is to be safe. So what has God placed in your heart to do? What are your dreams? What, what are you passionate about? What makes you pound the table and weep? What is in your heart to do that if you really, really go after it, You probably won't have a lot of stuff at the end of your life. You probably won't have lived that better life that some of your parents so desperately need you to have. But you will have Jesus, and you will have made a dent in the kingdom of God, and and God will have written his signature across your life. Israel is on this side of the river, a river that because of the season threatens to drown them. And if they do make it across, they're going to be greeted by kings and armies who want nothing more than to completely annihilate them. So what are you going to do when your leaders are gone and the rivers of life are in front of you and the world you're called to live in looks scarier and scarier every day? Go after it. God's faithfulness in your life does not depend on your pastors. God's faithfulness in your life does not depend on your parents. God's faithfulness in your life does not depend on your giftedness, your talents, or your achievements. 
And God's faithfulness in your life will not evaporate at a funeral or a raging river or a terrifying enemy. He's with you. And his mission is moving on. With or without you, so get on the train. God is not in heaven, but oh, oh, oh no. Moses is dead. What are we going to do? God is not in heaven saying, oh, uh, Billy Graham died. What are we going to do without R.C. Sproul? God is on his throne saying what he's always said, next, so be next. And the first steps are the hardest. That's why when God calls you to share the gospel with somebody, the hardest words out of your mouth are, hey, I need to talk to you about something. The first steps are the hardest, but if you walk with God on this mission, No one can stand against you. Nobody can stop you. Once God calls you to do something, you have total freedom to do it. And for the rest of this book, we find Joshua running into every battle. The days are literally not long enough for him to slaughter his enemies. God has to make the sun stand still in the sky. He goes to bed every night with a sword in his hand and he wakes up every morning with his armor on and he knows his mission. At one point, Joshua balks up to an angel of God because he knows his mission. Courage is not in a man. Courage is in a mission. Secondly, biblical godly courage rests on the assurance of God's presence in your life. He says, I'll be with you. And the call for you to lead, and that's exactly what you are called to do on your secular campuses and in your jobs and wherever you find yourself, you are called to lead out spiritually. And that call in your life is so often going to be a call to aloneness and loneliness. We know that we're never alone because God has a proven track record that speaks for itself. But our strength and our friendship and our companionship and our courage on the mission is directly linked to the presence of God in our life. Crawford Loritz, the pastor I referenced er earlier, said this, and you can apply this to any leadership, but spiritual leadership especially. Leadership is not a reflection of where things are. It is a bold, visible, prophetic reality of where things ought to be. Listen to me. When you're on your campuses and you're just trying to blend in and get through, spiritual leadership is not a reflection of where things are. It is a bold, visible reality of where things ought to be. God never calls people to easy assignments. But when he calls you to do something, it is his way or his statement of saying, I want to be with you. You will not find one person in all of scripture who God calls out to do something that is not accompanied with this promise. I will be with you. And the same is true with the Great Commission and every other calling. And anytime you're called to do something for God, your sinful nature will always present an easier way. And it usually makes a lot of rational sense, and it usually goes hand in hand with conventional wisdom, and it usually sounds good on paper, but it's not God's plan for you, it's not God's will for you, and so it's disobedience, and it's just easier. And it usually comes from the fear of man or pride. Courage is not that you're not afraid. Courage is fearing God more than you fear your environment. It's trusting God more than you trust the threats of men. And so courage is when you take your weak heart 
and trembling knees to a cross where you find a God who never leaves. Whenever I have somebody come in for counsel, I spend a couple of weeks with them just getting to know them and their situation and what they think they need. And <clears throat> I do that for a lot of reasons. One of the major ones is just how committed they are to actually coming back the second time. But by the third or fourth, I will say to them, okay, the next time we meet, we're going to set some goals. We're going to have some goal setting. And um, so I want you to think about that, and I'll think about that, and we'll set some goals. And so they come back, and they have their goals. I've never, ever, ever single one time been impressed with any of their goals that they set for themselves. That's kind of the point. And I look at them, intentionally unimpressed, and then I go. And I say my goals, and I love it. Because every time, they're looking at me like I have three heads. Terrified. Many say that's impossible. Which is when I say to them, if you want to set goals that you can meet on your own strength, then go see a different counselor. But if you want the Holy Spirit of God to show up and do something that you can't do for yourself, then let's get to work. So I don't counsel much, but I got that. <laughs> I got that from Phillips Brooks, this little statement. Don't ask for assignments equal to your powers. Ask for powers equal to your assignments. Isn't that good? Don't ask for assignments equal to your powers. Ask for powers equal to your assignments. Phillips Brooks taught Yoda how to talk. Biblical courage rests on a clear mission from God. Biblical courage rests on assurance of God's presence in your life. Number three, biblical godly courage, it rests on a willingness to act courageously by faith. Look how many times God says to Joshua, be bold, be strong, be courageous, only be courageous. It's not because God stutters. Here's something I've learned in my short life. Anything that God calls you to, especially his characteristics, he's not just going to pour that into you. He's not just going to miraculously give that to you. You're going to have to earn it. And so if you're called to, or if you feel convicted, like, oh, I'm just not a loving person. I need to grow in my Christ-like love. Nine times out of ten, God's going to put somebody really, really hard to love in your life. Or if you say, I, I just need to grow in my patience. I'm so impatient. Nine times out of ten, God's going to give you kids. So if you want to grow in courage, God's not just going to give you courage. He's going to put a really scary assignment out in front of you and say, I'm with you. Courage is like a muscle. It gets stronger when you use it. The word strong, be strong here, means to be resolved. Just like Daniel. When he was going down to Babylon, being led into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar, to a place he'd never been, he had, he's being taken away from what the Jews at the time would have understood to be the presence of God, the temple. He had most likely just seen his family killed in front of him. His city is sacked. Things are bad. Things are scary. And he's walking down as a captive. No idea what the future holds. And he does not wait to see what life will throw at him. He doesn't wait to see what's going to happen. He has a fear of God that is stronger than the fear of the enemy. The fear of the army that sacked his entire city. And so he is strong in his heart. He is resolved to not defile himself before God. And the same thing is true for you. The command, and it is a command from King Jesus to make disciples of all nations, 
which by the way, for those of you that will end up on secular universities, the nations will come to you. I was on Truman's campus just the other day and I heard some guy give a lecture about reptiles and he was from Sri Lanka. If somebody reaches that young man, we will send a missionary back to Sri Lanka. So don't you dare say you'll start serving God when you get out of college. The nations are going to come to you and our, our calling is to make disciples of the nations, baptizing them, teaching them to submit to everything that Jesus said. And lo, I am with you always. If you lack a sense of God's presence in your life, it's probably because you're not on mission. Remember Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he himself said, I will not desert you. I will not forsake you. So that we are confidently when we say, when we're confident when we say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? God is not held hostage by how you're wired. God is not held hostage by what you like to do. God is not held hostage by the decisions you've already made. God is not held hostage by careers that are projected to make good money. Cross the river. Fight. You don't have time for weakness. You don't have time to adapt your ministry and your calling to cultural norms. Stop being so easily offended. You don't have time for that. You don't have time to constantly be analyzing your, yourself and your effectiveness. You don't have time to use spiritual jargon to sanitize the fact that you're not living in obedience. You don't have time for any of that because the fact remains you can't steer a parked car. Be bold. Act courageously. Number four, biblical courage is anchored deep in the word of God. Deep in the word of God. The role of God's word and courage is indispensable. Look at the text. It says it over and over and over and over again. Be careful to do all that I have commanded you. Do not turn from it, from the right or from the left. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You will meditate on, on it day and night. Be careful to do all that is written in it. That's why I chose this text. I was originally going to talk from the story that I started with from Saul. But when I read this text, I chose it because I have a very deep concern for the epidemic of biblical illiteracy among young people. I am very concerned about the epidemic of biblical illiteracy among young people. Charles Spurgeon said, if you find a Bible that is falling apart, it probably belongs to somebody who isn't. God's presence and his faithfulness to you on this mission walks hand in hand with this book. There is no other way to have a relationship with God other than through this book. This is our life. It is the very food that we eat, the air that we breathe. How, how dare you not invest your life in this book? How dare you not read this book? Well, I'm not a reader. It's hard to understand. I didn't get anything out of it today. How dare you? This is the holy 
word of God. How dare you not read this book? We have to know it. We have to live it and breathe it and eat it. Because this text gives us three things that we have to do with it. Number one, we have to proclaim it. It will not depart from your mouth. Listen to me. Your friends and the new friends that you're about to make they don't need you to just be nice they don't need to be moralized they don't need a better philosophy for living they don't need practical christianity they don't need psychobabble to help them increase their self-esteem. And they certainly don't need your wisdom. What your lost friends need is a fresh word from God. The God who created them. And the God who intimately knows them. Secondly, he says, and meditate on it. The word meditate means a dull noise. We just got to new foster girls a couple months ago and they didn't sleep well and sleep through the night and so Stephanie went out and bought them noisemakers and it's just this droning white noise some of you are like that some of you need a fan going when you're sleeping it's a constant hum in the background and in just a couple of minutes you don't even know you're hearing it but it drowns out all the other noises. This is the word of God. We store it up. We meditate on it. We take it in until it becomes that constant humming drone in the background of all that we do and it blocks out all the other noises that would distract us. This is the word of God. We store it up like a Squirrel gathers nuts. A squirrel doesn't gather nuts and look at each individual one. Does this mean something to me today? He stores them and he stores them and he stores them and he stores them because he knows the day is coming when he's going to need it. A lot of Christians that don't have a good Bible reading life don't have it because they're, they're selfish, devotional readers. They just want God to speak to them today. And so when he doesn't speak to them for a few months, they get tired and they, f they quit. Your Bible reading, it's wonderful when it is devotional. It's wonderful when you hear a fresh word from God. But it doesn't matter if that doesn't happen because your Bible reading isn't a debit account. It's not you just like put so much in there to get you through the week or get you through the month. It's your savings account. You store it up and you store it up and you store it up and you know that when you read and you don't hear anything special from God, it's still not gonna return void. You're just getting it in there and you're cramming it in there and you're storing it up and you're storing it up because the day's gonna come when the Holy Spirit brings all that to fruition and you're gonna need it. And number three, you do it. People who say the Bible is boring might read their Bible, but they don't let the Bible read them. They might get in the Bible, but they don't let the Bible get into them. If you think this book is boring, I can guarantee you it's because you're not doing this book. Because there's nothing boring about a missional life. God demands our obedience And I don't want you to be confused. How you obey God is how you obey every word in this book. And it's not that God needs your holiness, but your lost friends do. Saul sinned. He transgressed the commandments of God because he feared the people and listen to them. And you, like Saul, will always obey who or what you fear. When I look at you, I'm very proud of you. 
but I also see a whole bunch of untapped potential. Many of you are like standing on the edge of the high dive, just afraid to jump. It's not too late to change your plan. It's not too late to change your school. It's not too late to go on that three to six month mission trip that you deep in your heart want to do before you start school. Just do all that God calls you to do. You don't have to be afraid. He's with you. You know this. Do you really think he's going to leave you? Do you really think he's going to abandon you? So repent of your fear of man. The Bible says you can learn the fear of God by focusing on him. Live missionally in the presence of God. Act courageously by faith. And have a radical, stubborn, unrelenting, obnoxious commitment and dependence on this book. Father, thank you for this class and I thank you for this word from Joshua or from you to Joshua and how it still stands true today I've been walking with you for a lot of years and I suppose I'm not much further in this fight of fear of man than I was when I started my walk maybe a little further but it's not one of those things that goes away easily So teach us the fear of you and hold on to these students.